the sounds of unification are echoing throughout Europe. European parliamentarians are hard at work shaping a new kind of society. Strengthening economic ties. Forging bonds of European unity. Putting the finishing touches to what will become a third world superpower. How will this coming union affect you? This week on The World Tomorrow, an eye-opening look inside the new Europe. This week on The World Tomorrow, David Hume. We're living in a time of great changes in international affairs. And it's in Europe today that the most remarkable changes are underway. Yet surveys show few have any idea what's really taking place. This week, we're going to show you what's happening inside the new Europe. It's a vitally important subject with enormous implications for our time. Many observers are forecasting a major shift in the global balance of power in the next decade. As the power and prestige of the United States appears to be faltering on many fronts, others are beginning to move towards center stage on the world scene. It's entirely possible that given a major financial collapse, right-wing dictators could arise in the free world. In fact, some experts warn of that very thing, a warning that this program has been making for years. We begin by taking stock of East-West relations. Separated into two opposing camps following World War II, the Europeans have a boundary marked in some places by barbed wire, walls, and guard towers. On the one side is the West, a mercantile powerhouse, a bustling manufacturing and trading superpower. On the other side is Eastern Europe, much less economically developed, and presently under the dominance of the Soviet Union. But Europe is changing. This situation we've known for four decades, a continent divided between East and West, is in the grip of profound change. Europe may be on the way to being knit together into a startling new configuration. And Europeans on both sides are approaching a decisive moment in their modern history. Of course, it's impossible to understand these important developments without first taking a look at the 12-nation European community or common market. Surprisingly, some have no knowledge of it. Fewer than one-third of Americans, for example, have ever heard of the community. That, according to a Gallup survey. Nevertheless, the EC is one of the most remarkable developments of the 20th century. As the war ended in 1945, the continent of Europe lay in ruins. Recovery slowly got underway, and the war-ravaged nations of Western Europe began searching for a means of preventing such future catastrophes. Statesmen suggested that if Europe-wide interests could somehow be placed above national allegiances, future wars on the continent might be avoided. They proposed that the economies of Western Europe's nations be bound tightly together. It was this thinking that led to the signing of the Treaty of Rome on March 25, 1957, creating the European Economic Community, or Common Market. Today, the organization is referred to simply as the European Community. It's headquartered in Brussels, the capital city of Belgium. The community's original members were France, West Germany, Italy, Belgium, the Netherlands, and Luxembourg. In 1973, Denmark, Ireland, and Great Britain became members. Greece joined in 1981. Portugal and Spain were added in 1986, making 12 nations in all. The European community has experienced such rapid economic growth that it's become the world's largest trading bloc. It's a bigger force in world trade than the United States and Japan combined. 
And now the pace of economic integration is accelerating even more. By December 31st, 1992, community planners hope to achieve an economic Europe without frontiers, a single great European marketplace of 320 million people. We asked British economist Michael Stewart, co-author of the best-selling book Apocalypse 2000, to describe what Western Europe will be like after 1992. There will be no customs barriers and exporting from Britain to France or Germany to Italy will be exactly the same as exporting from Texas to California or New Mexico to Massachusetts. So in that sense, uh, we will have a unified market of the same sort of size in terms of population as the United States of America. Noted British journalist and historian Paul Johnson had this to say about the global implications of a Europe without frontiers. On the other hand, the opportunities are enormous because once this huge market gets going, and it's going to be a real proper market with no barriers whatever, that's going to give a tremendous shot of energy to the European economy. And I think it's going to affect countries like Japan and the United States too because they are going to have to build within the market to get under the tariff barrier. So really, it's going to affect the whole of the advanced nations of the world. Both of these observers are pointing up the unprecedented impact this new Europe will have. Our next comment is from John Palmer, the Brussels-based correspondent for the British newspaper, The Guardian. Here he explains further about the common market. The European community was launched in 1957, and one of its objectives was to create a genuine internal market. No barriers to trade, no barriers to the movement of capital, no barriers to the movement of people. It hasn't worked out like that for a variety of reasons. The process slowed down in the 1960s, and we had the growth of all kinds of invisible and visible barriers to trade between member states. So the idea is that by the end of 1992, all of these barriers will disappear. Frontier controls, passport controls, a single market in the full sense of the word. We'll have technical harmonization of standards throughout the community, the same light bulb socket in Rome as in uh, Berlin, uh, the same uh, tax laws as far as they apply to customs and value-added tax. This is the proposal. So that in a sense, by then, the hope is that they will have achieved what they hope to achieve 30 years ago, but haven't yet done. So after more than three decades in existence, the European common market will finally live up to its name, and the entire world will feel the impact of its growing economic might. But the business of the European community is not just business. Its far-sighted founders anticipated a future political federation, a kind of United States of Europe. It's a laudable goal, but not one without dangers. After all, an architect does not know to what use others may put his building. The community's long-range goal is to establish a political union. In effect, to reduce nations to states or provinces. To create a single European nation-state. Some foresee the European Parliament, today a relatively powerless body, becoming a potent political force in the years ahead, as we're about to hear. The European community is beginning to develop that political voice through foreign policy cooperation and through the beginnings of a debate about a new kind of Europe. And I think that Europe is going to be more supranational, federal if you like, and ultimately, and perhaps in the not too distant future, it will be seriously discussed as to whether we should have a president of the United States, whether the European Parliament should become a real lawmaking body as opposed to an advisory body, and then I think we'll be coming close to the kind of Europe you described. Now this is something which we think people in, in Europe haven't really woken up to. Certainly people in the United States haven't woken up to. There are now direct elections to the European Parliament. And a parliament, although on paper the European Parliament it sits partly in Strasbourg and partly somewhere else and it's a bit of a joke, once you have a parliament which is directly elected by 250 billion people, you have potentially an immensely powerful um, organism. And that brings us to some other questions. How large will the new Europe become? Will the economic and political superstate now under construction stop at the present borders? Will Eastern and Western Europe one day be united? Today the terms Eastern Europe, Western Europe and the Iron Curtain are familiar language. But Europe hasn't always been this way. In fact, the present political division 
is a profoundly unnatural one. History reveals older, more traditional arrangements, more in keeping with Europe's cultural roots. Take, for example, the old region of Middle Europa. It's a German term meaning Middle or Central Europe, and it's been receiving a great deal of renewed attention in recent months. Middle Europa is the heartland of Europe, where for centuries German-speaking peoples played a predominant role. It's not primarily a geographical term, but a cultural and historical one. And historically, Middle Europa is neither east nor west. It's middle ground in the center of Europe. Though there's debate over the definition of its borders, Central Europe can roughly be said to include the modern day nations of East and West Germany, Austria, Hungary, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Romania, Northern Yugoslavia, and parts of Northern Italy. Middle Europa effectively ceased to exist after the Second World War with the divide between East and West, but the concept remains alive and well. A nostalgia for Middle Europa is reviving among Central Europeans today. Many of them are trying to get in touch with their common origins. Erhard Busek is former deputy mayor of Vienna and author of the book Project Middle Europa, in English, Project Central Europe. He gave us these observations about the longing on the part of East Europeans for more contact with the West. The third thing is, I think, a kind of nostalgia. Nostalgia that there was a situation, it might be in connection with the Austro-Hungarian monarchy, uh, where different people can live together with different languages uh, in a bigger form of uh, a state or cultural community. This is one of the reasons why Middle Europa is coming up in Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Poland, some parts of Yugoslavia, uh, because it was a better situation for them in this time. Now why is all of this so important? Because the changes occurring in Europe will dramatically affect the whole world and we need to be alert to the possibilities. You might be wondering why we place such stress on Central Europe. Well, the Scottish geographer Halford J. McKinder put it well when he wrote in 1904, Who rules East Europe commands the heartland. Who rules the heartland commands the world island. Who rules the world island rules the world. So Central Europe is of vital strategic importance. Some observers are saying that a revived Middle Europa might serve as a rallying point or a magnet bringing all of Europe back together. I asked the prominent Hungarian historian Dr. Peter Hanuk of the University of Budapest for his thoughts on Central Europe. I think that the concept of Central Europe is not only a scholarly matter of discussions among historians and not only a matter of nostalgia but I think now the problems of Central Europe are part of a larger concept, a larger plan for Hungary, namely it's now a question of survival, I would say. Uh, Hungary always made a part of Central Europe or Western Europe as religion, as culture, as the political framework uh, within the Habsburg monarchy and so on. Now, we cannot find a balance, uh, a balance of living, politically living, and living in a liberal uh, state, a liberal condition, except belonging to Central Europe. And all our cultural uh, contexts and cultural traditions uh, attach us to the Central European region. There's also a great deal of enthusiasm for resurrecting Middle Europa coming from West Germany. The two Germanys occupy a unique position in the middle of Europe. In the words of West German President Richard von Weizsäcker, West Germany has become the east of the west, East Germany the west of the east. Significantly, East Germany is today the strongest economy among the various Soviet satellites, and West Germany is the strongest economy in Western Europe. The West Germans are looking eastward. They're aggressively pursuing stronger ties with East Germany and with Eastern Europe as a whole. 